there's this incredible meme of thought going around right now that we are in a very uncertain time. Mm. So I'd like to disabuse people of this idea that we're in, in an uncertain time, right? Right. This time right now is no more certain or uncertain than any other time. We like to say that the 9-11 was uncertain and 2008 was uncertain and now is even more uncertain. The only thing that's uncertain is people. Like the time is not uncertain. There's no certainty or, or uncertainty in the world. Like if I look at a tree, it's a tree, but where, show me where there's uncertainty. Mm. You can't see it. It's not there. Mm. So what's really important for people to realize is what's out there that we're dealing with is not uncertainty. It's in us that there's uncertainty. And there's a collective agreement around the idea that right now we are all uncertain. Mm. It doesn't mean that the times we live in are uncertain. And the critical thing about that is that uncertainty gives us a lot of discomfort. Yes. It gives us, you know, people don't like being uncertain. We don't like it. It's unsafe. It's, it feels bad. Yeah. Right? They did a study on cancer patients. Cancer patients were happier to know the result of their test, mm. even though this is all patients who had cancer. Mm. So every 100% of them were given bad results. Mm -hmm. And yet their anxiety levels and their upset levels were far higher right before they got the results than after they got the results. Yeah. It gives people comfort to be certain about bad things more than being uncertain. We're living in a time when you have no choice but to innovate. And for many of us, that's as scary as hell. But it can also be the most exciting adventure. For the first time since World War II, we have the opportunity to change everything, to make our world a better place. For those of us in business, that means making your team and customers' worlds better. I'm Judy Selmans, host of the Engage to Innovate podcast, talking all things innovation. So relax, take some time out from your schedule and immerse yourself in the learnings shared by our guests. This week's guest is Michael Lee. He's an innovativity instigator from Johannesburg. I confess I had to Google that, so looking forward to finding out what that even means. As you might expect from someone who's an active promoter of creativity, he has a wide background in making innovation happen, including film and TV production. He has a new book on the way called The Innovation Explosion. He runs his own company, Create Your Creativity, and is Chief Visionary Officer for the Human Innovation Project. Lots to cover with Michael. I'm Judy, and today with my co-host, Eric, we welcome Michael to the stage. Yay! Hi, Michael. <laughs> hey, guys, Judy and Eric, how are yeah. you? Oh, we're exceptional, actually, at the end of our day, and it's very generous of you to get up at the beginning of your day on the other side of the globe but still i guess the southern hemisphere so southern it's still hemisphere yeah. yes and we don't get to play rugby against you this year so oh, far bugger, which yeah. Is a, yeah well you know as long as the toilet turns the other way from the northern hemisphere we're still we're still buddies you know <laughs> <laughs> you know i want to jump in because when i read your profile and a bit more about what you do i have to be totally honest and say the term you know innovativity instigator totally i had to go and google it which i've said in my intro so i just it's like i had no idea what it means so i really would love a bit of an explanation on how that term came along yeah sure there's there's two parts to that obviously there's the word innovativity which is the part you probably had to google and you probably didn't do too well googling it you got that right <laughs> And there's the term instigator, which is just a, a choice of a word. So let's, on the first part, um, you know, I'm testing that word. It's, the problem is that, you know, when you say creativity, people think about art, uh -huh. right? Yes. And, 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 and like you have to then explain to them why it's not about art. And then if you say innovation, people think it's about like machinery or, or technology. And you have to explain to them why it's not, you know? So in the book that I've written, I've tried using the word inactivity, which is obviously a, you know, sort of portmanteau mixed together word of the two. And it sounds a lot better than like creenovation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. So, plan so you know, for me, inactivity is basically the whole process from 
there's a problem to solve and then you implement the solution. So there's the creative part and the innovation part. And to, I mean, really innovation is just creativity with action, you know? Yeah. Um, That's a great description. And, well, it's, it's, it's pretty much what it is, right? I mean, you know, so innovativity to me is more of an attitude. Creativity is kind of an accident. I mean, we're born with it. Innovation is very much intentional, but I think for me, innovativity is like an attitude. You know, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of approaching life. Instigator, I just like that. I was playing with different words. You know, on LinkedIn, you only have 120 characters. Some people <laughs> manage to have 240 from the old days, and if they don't change it, they can yeah, keep Yeah, I know. Somehow. That's really cool trick, that one. <laughs> It is, right? And it's really unfair. But, you know, life is not fair, so it's fine. But I had to then figure out what do I say in, in a short space, you know, that gets people to understand something about what I do. And that's what I came up with at this point. I'm testing it out because, you know, most people then end up not knowing what innovativity means anyway. Uh, I've got a first round of students. We've just started a creativity coach certification process. It's the only one in the in the world that I know of that's like an easily accessible one. Uh, I know there are a couple that exist, but they're like two year processes. And so we have uh, around 40 people in that. I'm going to test this out on them as well. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So what is the criteria for being involved in your training? Is it what sort of people get involved in it? Is it are there creative people that want to just learn how to put it in the right direction? Or if there is, is there a typical profile? Well, you know, there has to be, right? Because otherwise, all the people that want to um, help you do your business tell you that you're not doing it right. You have to have a profile of exactly who you're selling to. Unfortunately, I've really struggled with that. Um, the, there's two different things here, right? The, the creativity coaching certification is a brand new thing that I'm doing in partnership with the guy who trained me as a coach. Um, and that's, a, that's my creativity training that I do plus the coaching part. So that is specifically for people who are coaches, right? Um, which, which is very specific. And in that case, I'm kind of happy that I've found a, a market that's clear. The other part of the training that I've been doing, um, I'm currently putting it into video form so it's more accessible and, and, and easier to do. But that has been all kinds of people, mostly entrepreneurs. Uh, businesses I've worked with have been smaller businesses also. Yeah. And I guess if I have to make it up, uh, looking at the statistics, a lot more women do it than men, which right. I find interesting. Yeah. Um, it might just be because, uh, I don't know, I actually have no idea why that is. But, but uh, it's been otherwise very cross different, different types of work and different types of people, people who think they are very creative, people who think they aren't. Um, there's very, very little except for the gender thing. Uh, I think men maybe are just less less able to take on radical thinking change as easily. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm sure Eric's isn't so a problem. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I, well, maybe there's a personality profile in there somewhere that, that makes people open to doing that sort of thing. I suppose it's an, it's an ongoing question really on what motivates people. I, uh, I found it interesting, Michael, uh, because I've read your LinkedIn article, your excellent article, which is the foreword to your book. And you explored a number of themes in that text. And uh, certainly one of them was about how we lose our creativity, you know, from, from, from children, from being children with open minds. And then eventually things like the education system, social conditioning and so on catch up with you. So maybe on the male side, there are particular stereotypes perhaps that, 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 that push men yeah. further into maybe that more left brain space. It's, it's certainly possible, you know, that, that men just don't want to change as much as women do, or, or you know, they're not, as, they're not as open to the idea. I, I, it could be possible. Of course, the men that I've worked with aren't like that. So yeah. yes, <laughs> exactly. So um, what, what is the re what's, what do people gain from doing your course? How, why, why would they want to do your course basically? Oh, oh because the, their life will change. The heavens will open and um, <laughs> money will awesome. fall from the sky. Fantastic. Yeah. No, I'm look uh, in, in more serious response to that is that, you know, we, I have tracked people's scores on creativity testing and it has consistently improved their, um, scores by, you know, about 30% on average 
which is pretty good considering that they're already starting from a baseline that couldn't improve more than about 50 or 60 percent, you know, get to 100. Uh, but also they've, you know, the, in, in, the, in the workshops that, that I run, whether it's going to be the recorded ones now or the, or the live ones, everybody is asked to take on a project that they'd like to finish that maybe they left behind in their life and couldn't see a way forward with. Uh, or it could be something they're working on now, which they couldn't uh, get, get the movement they'd like. And, you know, universally, people have made astounding leaps in those projects uh, and sometimes dropped them and left them behind and started something different by the time we finish. But, but either way, they, they've, the, the reported results, the testimonials, people have said great things. So it seems to work. That's yeah. all I can say. It, it, and it, basically, the point of it is to free your mind from itself, you know. Right. Um, and, I, and Eric just kind of touched on that now. You know, that we have a we have this sort of personality we've built up over time and we're very proud of it usually. And it's a big uh, push in the world to be proud of who we are and all those things. And that's terrific. And it's deadly because the minute we get proud of who we are, we can only think the way that we think. And yeah. unfortunately that limits the ability to think in ways that are, you know, broader than ourselves. So it's a, it's a challenge balancing between, yeah, being, you know, knowing who you are, being confident in yourself and all that, and still being open enough to be flexible to go, you know, something that I wouldn't normally think is okay. Yeah. And, and I would think also you combine that with social conditioning and other people's influence on telling you what you're good or not good at. And so all of that combined tends to restrict you in your creative thinking, I would think. Is that, would that be fair? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Look, the way to describe it, I think, in a simple way, you know, I mean, the, the two things that I like to say to people that are quick, quick to get them to see what's going on. One is Eric already referred to is a study that was done by George Land 50 plus years ago. Um, and looking at five year old children, 98 percent scored as geniuses in creativity and looking at adults, 2 percent scored as geniuses. So, yeah. you, you know, something weird has gone on there because you know, you or me or whoever, all of us were creative geniuses at five and none of us are now is a pretty damning statement, you know? Um, are you allowed to say damning on Australian? Absolutely. Podcasts? You know, we're, okay. we're um, pretty liberal here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not and the second, the second thing is there's this idea of thinking out of the box. And I like to tell people like really quickly, like you're not going to learn that from me because it's impossible to think out of the box. It's what human beings do. We think in the boxes. You know, it's actually what animals do. It's how we make judgments. It's how we know what's right and wrong. It's how a lizard knows whether a certain berry is good to eat or not. You know, it, it knows what box to put it in in its mind. And okay. unluckily, as humans, we have lots of boxes, you know, a lot more than a lizard or a dog or something. So we get very excited about our boxes because our boxes define who we are. So, yes, if someone tells you you're great at this or that or bad at this or that, it goes into a box. Mm. You know? So the way to fix that is, this is kind of the basic of everything I talk about. And I've learned this from others. You know, I didn't make it up. It's the way to fix that is not to try to think out of the box. Because if I say to you right now, Judy Eric's think out of the box. Yeah. What happens? Well, you go blank, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I do sometimes. Well, and, and you should go blank because there's nowhere to go. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, if I stuck you in Johannesburg now with me and gave you a car and said, drive to Molly, go. Yep, given you know. my sense of direction is pretty bad at the best of times, <laughs> I'm down to, down to end up in wherever. And so it, we have a GPS for that reason. So, I mean, the, the basic is we have boxes in our minds. It's how we operate. You know, mm. if you think about all the things you've done today, how many times did you make a judgment about something? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And we do that because that's how we survive. Otherwise, we would stare blankly at the wall thinking of that blank space that you just thought about. Yeah, yeah, not achieving it. So anything. what we do is we think into the box. Okay. How can you identify your box and say, this box that I have, I'd like to expand that box. Right. Much easier, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you're basically your, your training gives you the tools to think within that spectrum more. View it differently? Yeah, look, it's, it's a matter of getting really clear what the boxes you have are. Right. And then taking actions to expand the boxes you have, change the boxes you have, rebuild new boxes, unlearn, relearn. You right. Know? But the idea of thinking out of the box is disastrous. 
It was it's the stupidest really thing anybody ever thought of. Yeah, that's a really, it, it, because everybody, that that's the first thing that you hear when you're talking about, most people talking about creativity will say, you've just got to think outside the box. You know, I mean, that, that's yeah. probably, you're right. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, fascinating. That, our our favourite uh, analogy for this is what will happen in many businesses that a meeting will be called, everybody come to the meeting room straight after lunch. We're going to sit there for an hour. We're going to be super creative. Now think outside of the box, as wild as you like, and off you go. <laughs> right. And meanwhile, everyone's sitting there and their minds are what they're going to get finished by the end of the day and, and, and all the rest of it. So I guess that's what you're looking to get around and, and, and change the mindset around that. Exactly. I mean, look, here's the funny thing that creativity is clearly a very, a very common skill of humans. If all five year olds have it. Yes. Right. And it's clearly a very important skill because LinkedIn said last year that it's the best investment you can make in yourself is strengthening it. Uh, Forbes has called it the skill of the future. Mm. You know, I know IBM has great quotes around how important creative thinking is to companies and to leaders. You know, and one could go on with references to, you know, important institutions that have said creativity is the most important thing in the world. The World Economic Forum listed in 2015 that by now, five of the top 10 skills in business would be creative skills. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand, it's very necessary. On the other hand, it's actually very common for humans somehow. So why is it such a big deal? You know, it's because obviously we need to retool the way we do things and think because there's something about the way that we've built our system around thinking has led us to a point where everybody loses the most important skill we have that we were born with. Yeah. That seems kind of stupid. I don't you know. know. And I'm with you, but I'm just thinking here, if I was, do you, when you do your training, do you find that you get like one company sending all of their team members, for example, because I would think, Within a team, you'd almost need everybody to do your training. Would that be fair? You look, it would, according to what Eric was just saying, right? If you walk into a, into a workshop of a group of people from a team and half the team hasn't done the kind of thinking you need to do to get back to the creative mind you could have and the other half hasn't done it, I suppose that would be pretty rough. Yeah. Know? Okay. I mean, but it's like, not I, normally well, your thing then to do it in a team environment within a company, for example. I No, I have done, but it's usually been full teams. I haven't really right. done it with teams that were not full teams. You know, I haven't done a company say where there's many thousands of people and just randomly selected people did it. Uh, it's always been a team or a small right. company or, you know, uh, so I don't really have experience in like what happens when, kind of foolishly you don't do the whole team. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Oh, no, no yeah. that, that, that makes total yeah. sense. Yeah, no, no, because yeah, if yeah. everyone's on the same page and you all understand the, the dimensions within the box <laughs> and where you fit, do personalities or profiling and some description also go into identifying what your boxes are? Well, mine or people's? Uh, well, anybody who undertakes your training. Well, that's, you know, that's, yeah, I mean, in their, in their process, there's a lot of different tools you can use. What, what, what we do is we go through step by step. We go through the, you know, putting safety in place in terms of giving ourselves permission to transform, right? Um, so the first step is putting safety in place to make our subconscious feel comfortable because our subconscious has basically spent our, most of our life being beaten up. Like we're like a bully on a playground, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, like your subconscious mind is the one that tries to do everything impulsively and have fun and do the things that it, it's supposed to do. 95%, they say, of our thoughts are, are not conscious. Um, so it's busy, but it's always being told it's not good enough. It's, we don't like its ideas. It's not the right thing anymore. We've learned something new. This is the way we are. Here's the boxes we get to play in. That's all, right? Yeah. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is people, and I think this is a male thing, so maybe that's part of the reason is that, you know, some people lock it up entirely like in a dungeon and just like don't want to hear from it at all, you know? Um, so I'm not sure which is better, being locked away in the dark or being beaten up every day. But either way, your subconscious doesn't really trust you. Yeah. You know? 
So the first step is to put some kind of safety in place so that your subconscious does begin to trust. And it does, it does that quickly. Um, hmm. The next step is to look at who we are and, and what choices we have in shifting that, you know, and some people have done transformational work for a long time and they're really, they're really open to the idea that they can shift it. And some people don't get what you're talking about for a while, you know, uh, because they, they think that who they are is actually uh, inevitable, um, which it's not. Uh. You know? uh, and so I've forgotten the question by now, but... Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, I think that's really interesting from a yeah. personality yeah. type point of view. And uh, when you say that people think they, well, they think they are in one particular box of a personality type, which is my personal hobby horse with personality tests where people get stereotyped or typecast into being X, A, A, B, A, Q type personality. And that's it. And that stays labeled around you, particularly in an organization forever. Whereas, you know, I would have thought if you were given the room to move to actually explore other dimensions of yourself, that you might be surprised by that. So do you find that, that people find other sides to themselves? Oh, definitely. I mean, the personality testing you're talking about is, is critically important, actually, because I don't know if you know Carl Bates. He does something called the Constellation Compass. I think no, he's, not come across um, right. he's Australian, but he lives in South Africa. Um, so he fits into this conversation. But I, I was recently on a, a summit with him and you know, he's very focused on that kind of uh, getting people to figure out how they fit into an organization based on what personality type they are. Right. And, you know, you need to start with the reality. Reality is we are where we are. Yeah. Right? Sure. And, and, and I am who I am today because of my past. And it led me up to being who I am, or that's how all of us got here. The, big thing that I learned over many years of transformational training I, I was studying in, you know, is, is how you can easily release that and shift it. And right. why easily as an exaggeration, it, it takes a lot of focus and a lot of uh, training and a lot of work and a lot of thought. And, but, you know, the idea that we are who we are because of what happened in the past is actually completely false. We are who we are because we project what happened in the past into our future in front of us and live into that future, right? Mm. And we can shift that by simply projecting a different self into the future and living into that. However, of course, since 95% of what we do is unconscious, it's not quite that simple because we can't really control 95% of what's going on. Mm. So it takes practice, it takes habit, yeah. it takes training, it takes work. You know? Yeah, like, like but any... It starts, yeah. Start, yeah, yeah, of course. And it, and it starts with that first moment, though, of yes... I can shift my box. You know? yeah. yeah. Until that moment happens, it's never going to happen. If someone is convinced that their personality is is rigid, is fixed. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Then, then there's no there's no movement. But uh, it, you have to know what your personality type or whatever or who you are now in order to shift it. You can't just blindly make up stuff out of the sky, right? I mean, there's a tree in front of your. I don't, you know, if there's, I'm looking at a tree. That's why I said this. I, <laughs> say something I think is horrible. I don't want to say this, but now I, I've committed to it. So if there's a tree in front of your window and it's sick and you have to chop it down, you can't start by imagining the tree's not there. You have to start by getting clear about how are you going to chop the tree down, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that starts with knowing what's the tree, like where it's positioned and how sick it is and what way it's going to fall when you chop it down. If you ignore that, then your house will get broken, you know, and the tree will potentially suffer if trees do in some way that it doesn't have to. <laughs> Bad example, but you get the point. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, right. no, very much so. The, the great thing is that you, what you do is provide that safety factor you mentioned earlier, where people can feel that they can move along rather than being stuck in that place. And yes, what you may say makes perfect sense. You, you have to start somewhere, but it's where you go in the future and what you project in the future, I guess. I know Judy has, uh, listens to particular philosophies <laughs> along those lines, which uh, was really fascinating. Yeah, it's where, where your mind 
can take you if you let it rather than letting the past perhaps drag it back. So what, which philosophies are these, Judy? Uh, well, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a, I've been doing quite a bit of study in the last couple of years in particular, but I've always been into mindfulness and, you know, so I'll use the law of attraction, but, but it's not just that, just for the sake of that's the obvious and most common, but it's, it's understanding and listening to the voice. I've, I've always been, and I think this might be a reason why you find women more into this is that I think naturally women are more intuitive and, and, and so from my personal perspective, I have always had a very strong intuition and I've I learned from a very early age that if I listened to that my world shifted so um, so it's understanding and understanding when it's actually telling you the right thing or if I'm coming from the wrong place and so there's all sorts of things that and I lo- I'm you know I'm just a perpetual learner I love to know how things work and so my brain's working all the time and and, and interesting because it's only fairly recently with someone else's material, I think I, even on LinkedIn, LinkedIn Michael, that uh, someone else was talking about shifting the, the box, if you like, for, to use your terminology. And, and, I, and I didn't really think about it because I, I, I thought, oh, I don't have st- set standard things I do. Of course, I'm sort of, no, I'm fine. I don't, you know, do things. And then I go, actually, of course I do. And, and you're right, everybody does. And, but I'm not sure that we, I'm not sure, well, because we're not taught to think like that. It's, again, an ed, from an education perspective. So why getting kids, I, I'm a big believer that we need to increase this type of education in a school level so that it keeps going as you grow into adulthood. Would, is that part of what your ambition is in some ways? Wow. I mean, you said a lot of... I'm oh, sorry. Um, I did say a lot of shit there. Follow, you said a lot of interesting stuff. So what is the part that you're asking me about the ambition? Oh, sorry. I, it, was, it was more that, you know, I, I do believe that if we can tap into it as a, as a child and, and learn to keep that uh, ability to intuition and remain, keep that creativity going listening to your inner voice and the, the, the subconscious and stuff. So, yeah, I, I guess that's where I'm, I'm really going. I've always been a big believer that we should be doing more education on that level with, with children. You know, it's, it's, it's a great question, Judy, because I, my experience with children is, is limited to my two daughters, really. <laughs> um, but, but it is obviously right? The, 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 the correct uh, way to be thinking is why would we want to have to retrain people to regain stuff that we lost when we could simply not lose it? Yeah. Um, that, that's, that seems like the best idea. The, you know, the challenge is right now we are where we are. It's the same conversation yeah. in a way about the individual. The society is where it is. And in order for us to shift the society, we have to start where it is. And yeah. where it is, is that our school systems don't do that. And the only way we're going to shift that is by shifting the school system and for now retraining people who are already, have already, you know, unfortunately yeah. lost Got that the bad connection. Habits. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so where we are right now is those two things have to happen. And I think, unfortunately, you know, we have a lot less control about the school systems because they're mostly run by governments yeah. Or, yeah. or private institutions that are taking over all the schools um, quickly. So if those institutions and governments don't shift, we end up in the same position. You know, the good thing about the current situation with COVID, you know, aside from the, aside from all the bad parts of it, like people dying and, and mm. people losing their jobs and companies going under and all the things that aren't good. The really great thing about it is that for 50 years, or, you know, 50 years ago, Alvin Toffler already was predicting or, or projecting that the world had to change in a way that was more or as fundamental as an ice age or as fundamental as the, anything that had ever happened in human history. Yeah. Uh, he specifically compared it to, uh, well, he, he had a list of other thinkers as well. They compared it to things like, you know, uh, animals coming out of the water onto land or, or, you know, the, the shift from, um, from an agrarian society to a, 
a society where people were not, you know, not living in one place. And the word has flown out of my mind. That's all right. Um, nomadic. nomadic, thank you. The shift from a nomadic society to a uh, agrarian society. So that the shift coming now is is bigger than that shift. You know? mm. So they were basically a number of thinkers, futurists, and so on in the 60s and 70s, who were saying that if you're familiar with the book Future Shock that Alvin Toffler yes. put out, which Yep. You know, the whole idea of that book was time is speeding up so fast that people are getting sick. People yep. can't function, that like they're having nervous breakdowns. And yet, 50 years later, not much has really changed. We got worse, um, actually. Probably, because we're shift, the, the, the shift is continuing and nobody's doing anything about mm. it, you know? Yep. So there are the, those, those first, you know, those first early adopters and the, and the, you know, the wizards who come in early have made the shifts. But why did Zoom go from 10 million users to 300 million users in like a week or two uh not long ago was because this virus came and made everybody stop yeah and realize that we haven't been paying attention yeah you know and not enough people are paying attention to the shift that's happening yes and that shift is a different way of thinking now we have to readdress how school works yes you know, now we have to readdress how we think about things Yet it's been something that people have been saying. It's not new. It's been fifty yeah. to seventy years. It's been going on. Yeah, at, yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I'm I'm just wondering though. In some ways, by adults undertaking your training, you know, one of I think parents can have such a big role and in influencing their children at home. I mean, some of the things that I'm learning now, I think, oh, wouldn't it have been awesome if I'd had a parent that understood all of this stuff instead of saying to me that I was some weird spooky child um, <laughs> because that's what I got and it was not no fault of their own but and you know so I sort of somewhat see an add-on benefit for your training and for those undertaking it is that they can go in and and implement some of that thinking in a home environment and therefore children and and it and it does have a snowball effect and so I think this it's what you're doing is is a really important shift in the and, and right helping us evolve because that's exactly what's happening to us now you know there's been a lot of readings on uh, writings and stuff on on the shift that's going on in our minds at the moment one of my favorite which you might like and you might have actually read yourself was a statement called calling this particular time while we're all in lockdowns around the world the great pause I just think that's an, an amazing, it's, it's a pretty exciting term. Yes, there are some, as you mentioned, some awful, awful things going on, but this is an interesting opportunity for us to um, get more in touch with stuff and, I, and particularly like what you're doing in that space to get in touch with and, and just being more part of the world and creating and being an exciting part. I don't know. I'm starting to ramble on. Well, excitement causes uh, people to go delirious and say lots of things. So I think it's fine. You're clearly, you're clearly inspired, um, <laughs> which is good, right? I think. Yeah. Um, what you said makes me think of three things. I, I, I'll just run through them quickly. The first one is that in my organization that we've just started called the Human Innovation Project, my partner in that is really enthusiastic about education, including early education. And she's the chairperson of the Presidential Commission in South Africa on the future of work in the fourth industrial revolution, hmm. which until COVID hit was at full speed, like a out of control train, uh, putting out, you know, about to put out their big report around the fourth industrial revolution. It's been a bit delayed now. But she's very focused on early education and, and education in general in the, in the organized way in schools and so on. Yeah. And uh, so that's very good for me because I don't have any experience with that other than having been a product of it. So it's, it's, I think it's really important that we take this kind of thinking everywhere because in work, it's critically important. In school, it's critically important. And yeah. Like you said, saving people from going through the trouble of having to uh, relearn what they already knew in the first place. Just as you mentioned the Human Innovation Project, and I was really fascinated by a reference you made to the Indigenous approach to innovation. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So, you know, Indigenous is a difficult word, but let us say that I know you guys in Australia have had an interesting history with it as well. Uh, yeah. 
basically, you know, there's a Western quote unquote way, right? Yep. And most of the innovation thinkers that we refer to are inevitably Western, most of them men, most of them white. And that way, there's nothing wrong with that way. It's absolutely exceptionally developed and, and uh, all the ideas we work from generally come from there. It overlooks in some ways, uh, there's two things here. It overlooks in some ways systems that have been built up in the indigenous knowledge systems uh, that are more in, uh, intuitive, yeah. that are more emotionally based, that are more based on connecting to what we know. And if you think about the shamans uh, in traditional societies, whatever yeah. we call them in different societies, you know, so in some yeah. it's the shaman in Africa, it might be called an Inyanga or a Songoma. Um, what do you guys call them in, in, in I'm, Australia? I'm actually not sure what the Aboriginal equivalent is, Australian Aboriginal. That, yeah. That's embarrassing, isn't it? I should probably know those things. I'm going to have to Google it after we get off the call now. <laughs> yeah, you can I, just can, I can visualise the, the role, yes. Well, it's essentially a shaman, right? I mean, yeah. a yes. shaman is yes. a word that seems to get applied uh, to, to different cultures. You know, they were the ones, and this is why in a way, I'm going backwards here, but in a way when we talk about how did it happen that we lost our creative thinking from five years old to now? You know, people always blame education. And there's a great TED Talk by Ken Robinson, which is the most watched TED Talk in history. Yes. Um, more watched than, than any celebrities uh, that have done TED Talks. And uh, it's all about how education ruins creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true, but education was developed in a system, and the system it was developed in, I think, is more responsible than education system, you know, because it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Yeah. And what it was supposed to do was to prepare us to function in the world. Yeah. And the way we function in the world up till now, up till this great pause and this great change that was predicted, has been to fit into roles that we do the same thing over and over again. And creativity has not been a very useful tool in the past. Mm. for most people who it was useful for was shaman right okay so if you look at the two percent that we that that remain creative geniuses in our society uh, according to these statistics it's kind of roughly you know it's roughly relevant to the number of shamans and artists and so forth even in a traditional society so there was a use for creativity and it was then restricted to those that needed to employ it so I think when you look at the, the, the systems of traditional societies, you end up looking at very specifically the, the people who were causing people to change, the shamans, the artists, the people that were recording history. Mm. That's where you find that in the indigenous, in the indigenous cultures. You know, it's not, a, it's not a common experience for the average person. So when you look at their systems, it's very much related to, you know, Judy, what you said about being in your intuition, being connected to nature, being connected to a general collective or an energy flow. Mm. You know, when you look at the circle of courage that's used in Native American traditions and was actually brought to Africa the same year that South Africa was liberated and has become heavily used here. Uh, so it, was, it is indigenous, but not African, but still used as African indigenous tool, strangely. The circle of courage, you know, takes us through steps of growing into adulthood through through character steps you know of learning the way okay. things are in the world and it's something again that in the in the transition from youth to adulthood in tr traditional cultures there's a process right yes. it's still it's still it still kind of lives there in like a bar mitzvah yeah or even a confirmation in in, in christianity but it doesn't yeah. live in the same way it's now just a thing for you to get presents and have a party and yeah. everybody be proud of you yeah. You know, traditionally, it was actually a rite of passage where people had to go through trauma and struggle yes. to confront their internal demons and become collective, you know, where a child is sort of not part of the collective, they're more run by the collective. And they say, like, it takes a village to raise a child. That's where that comes from, right? The, the, the traditional society raised the child together. When that person had to become a person, they had to do it by transitioning through some kind of struggle you know and our i mean our, our as a storyteller i can say like our whole storytelling paradigm of the western world that hollywood uses is based on that struggle and yet we yes. don't actually live through it we watch it on tv yeah yes we become 
insulated from that in, in, in many ways. Uh, the, the, that the, yes, because I, I, I love the Hollywood templates, you know, it's like the, the uh, Pixar storytelling elements, or what are the 22 or so, but the, the classic uh, sort of template for a story which involves struggle and then redemption and final victory and so on, but the story would be nothing without the struggle in, in, in the middle of it. And I think that's really fascinating because is it fair to say that it, it's in the struggle is where you have to be the most creative because you've got to think your way around the situation. Yeah. There's no creativity if there's no challenge. It's a very, very good point. You know, one of the things I like to, to point out is, is there's a difference between crisis and struggle. You know, we're currently in a, in a situation of struggle, not crisis and people have it wrong. The crisis, crisis is usually something that is a very limited time frame, right? Right. Um, it's something where you have to act quickly in order to survive the, the moment. I mean, maybe it's just a use of words, but to distinguish between them, you know, a crisis is when you walk through the bush and there's a lion in front of you. That's a crisis. Yeah. yeah. There's only one way to respond to that. It's been tried out for centuries, thousands <laughs> of years. It works, right? It's not run. Yeah. Uh, if you run, the lion will chase you. Yeah. And I don't know anybody faster than a lion. But, <laughs> you know, the, what you have to do is look at the lion in the eyes, be very gentle, don't be aggressive, but also confident. Back away from the lion carefully, uh, making noise and generally letting it know that you're not scared of it. Mm -hmm. Generally, that's the best move. There's really no better move. So being creative in a crisis is not a good idea. Right? Yeah. Being creative in a struggle, as you point out, is the only way to get through it, you know? So this current situation that we're all going through, and so there'll be some businesses that would say, well, I'm in a crisis, you know, the lion is staring at me. Yeah. So it would, then, then that's actually, I really love this analogy. So it's almost in that situation, and I have said to a few businesses that I mentor and things, it's like, it's okay just to deal with the situation you have to deal with. There'll be time for creativity when you've dealt with that situation. So it's if you feel, and because it may be a crisis to some people and in no, others, no, 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 yeah, will be. the struggle. For, yeah. Yeah. For yeah. many, it's an immediate yeah. crisis. But the struggle, as you so well articulate, is in the longer run, is, is it fair to say? And I guess I'm interested in your, your view on, you know, with a lot of these business owners right now that they need to creatively work their way through the struggle, but it's very hard when you know, you've got a lot of immediate existential issues going on at the same time. Do you have any tips on that? Well, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting what we're discussing now because I'm thinking of something that I hadn't thought of before. So thank you. Um, the, the, you know, the bottom line, and Judy just said it very well, you know, when you're in a crisis, you need to just get out of the crisis. Yep. And I'm not a crisis manager myself. I'm not going to try to give tips on the best way to get out of a specific crisis. However, the best way to get out of a crisis is to put all your focus on getting out of the crisis, I suppose. Mm. Yep. And it's, it's inevitable that a struggle is preceded by a crisis. Yes. In fact, in those kind of rituals we're talking about, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a crisis that was forced on them on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes in order to change, we have to force a crisis of some kind in order to cause the struggle to be possible. Yes. What's upsetting people is that in this case, the crisis was forced on us by not even someone we can blame. Everybody yeah. wants to blame China made it in a yes. lab now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but maybe there's just no one to blame. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to just accept this crisis got forced on us and it's nobody's fault. Yeah. Now we get through the crisis and get to the struggle. It's a lot more, you know, the struggle may not be pleasant, but it's a lot more enjoyable because you already have the feeling that you are engaging one of the most important things to human beings, which is mastery, which is the ability to achieve, right? Yeah. Um, right. You know, a dog, a dog's highest value is praise. I think, you yes. know, my dog is most most happy in the world when it is being praised. Absolutely. If I tell her she's good and I pat her and give her food. I was going to say a treat. Senses, 
you know, she's in heaven. Yes. A human being, generally humans are most satisfied when we are told that we're great. Yes. That we've achieved something outstanding, that we've done a good job. Yeah. It's kind of like praise, but it's something beyond praise. Mm. You know? It's a sense of mastery, a sense of achievement. And I think struggle gives us that opportunity. Crisis does not. Yeah. You know? I love that. We get, through a crisis, yeah. we get through a crisis and we're just like, wow, thank goodness I made it through that. Yeah. But we don't really feel like we've achieved something. We feel yeah. like we've survived something. Yeah. Yeah. So but step struggle gives us the up. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I was just going to say that the, the, the next step then is that we've got to go. I think what people are struggling with right now is that they've, they've dealt with, they've rung the accountant, they've rung the lawyer, whatever they've had to do. They've rung the government department to get funding, et cetera, et cetera. So they've dealt with the immediate lion yeah. facing them down. But yeah. now they've got to get creative. They actually have to get to the next level, which is the struggle, which is the, and getting more creative. If there were tips you could provide on giving that to, to listeners that are, because I think that's where most people are now. They've all been going through the grief and the panic and the, oh my God, what just happened? And now it's, okay, this is well, the what reality. What, what I do now? So, yeah. Sure. I mean, look, the, the, the quickest way to open, let me just say this. I think the first thing is with a crisis, the, the goal is, and like you just said, the goal is really to get out of it as fast as possible. No one wants to be in it. Yeah. You don't want to stand looking at the lion for a long time. Nope. Um, once you're away from that lion and you're free again, the first thing you need to do is, is calm yourself down. Right? Mm. Um, yep. And, and that, that's the safety conversation we had. The problem a lot of people have with creative thinking is, they don't take that first step and companies certainly don't, you know, when, when, when companies want to go now brainstorm a new idea, they want to start brainstorming like on the first, after yeah. people have a coffee and a biscuit, yeah. they want to start brainstorming and that's completely wrong. Yeah. You know, the brainstorming comes in the middle of the creative thinking process. It comes, if I had a diagram in front of me to show you, you know, it literally comes in the middle. There's a whole bunch of stuff you have to do before your mind thinks of new ideas. Yeah. And that's yeah. why great creative thinkers in history, you look back, they often went on long walks. They often, uh, Einstein yeah. played the violin intentionally. Mm. So one of the great practices, you know, that, that people, organizations can take on is, number one, create a safe space around creative thinking. So if it's a, if it's a person, it's a little different. If it's an organization, it means really making sure that everyone feels at liberty to come up with new ideas. Mm. That, that may not exist in a lot of companies, mm -hmm. especially if they've just gone through a crisis. Yeah. Right. Um, secondly, is once you start working on the boxes that exist, which is looking at where are they now and really getting into that. Don't just skip across it thinking you understand it. You don't. Mm. None of us understand ourselves as well as we think we do. In fact, statistically, they find that other people can explain us better than we can. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and, and we yet don't want to listen to those other people when they tell us stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the first important step in new ideas is to be clear on your old ideas. Where are you? What, why do you have those ideas? Where do they yeah. come from? Yeah. And I'm not saying go to a therapist and spend six years figuring out how you got to be <laughs> this way. You know, the personality profiling, Eric was talking about that he, that he likes to work with, you know, those kind of things. And in, in, in my book, I list a bunch of the ones that exist that go back in history to Enneagrams, you know? Right. Um, I, I mean, they, they go back into... The, the I Ching is essentially originally based on personality profiling. Yeah. Um, so it goes back a long time. There's lots of ways to do it, but the point is to be clear about it and you know, not fool yourself, either as an organization or as an individual. And then once you've done that, you can start to look at how do you generate new ideas, new ways of thinking after you've gone through the steps of becoming safe with how things are and becoming clear on how things are. You know? Then you can yeah. start to play the tricks and the games and the things. But until you do those two things, it's just, it's just like doing a crossword puzzle. You know, it's fun. It gives you some thoughts. But at the end, you don't know new words by doing the crossword puzzle. You know new words because you cheat on the crossword puzzle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's excellent advice. It'd be because it would be so natural and, and, and human nature right now, as you said, go through the crisis and immediately jump into gosh, we've got to get all these ideas. Let's do it now. Mm. We, we haven't mm. got any time. And yet stepping back for a moment, 
breathing everything you said uh, just just makes so much sense and, and and you will think more clearly that way absolutely i mean that's it it simply is how it works. you know there's a creative process that our brain uses i mean five year olds didn't learn how to do this yeah right they just do it yeah. it's like you know you watch a horse give birth and the baby horse gets up in the first minute and mm. and we go wow like humans can't do that right i mean it takes us a year and we have to but when we learn to walk it's the same thing as the horse mm. it takes a long time but babies get up they start to walk they fall down most of the time if you watch videos that they're they laugh at it they think it's hysterically funny when they fall down right now imagine taking your brain and putting it back in yourself when you were a year old learning to walk you'd still be sitting on the ground today Right. <laughs> you'd, you'd be going like this is terrible i can't do this someone else is better at this uh, than me i'm i this mustn't be for me i'm you know i've fallen down like five times now i mean this is ridiculous oh that's a great so, i yeah. love that <laughs> yeah i mean it's 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 you know it's just important to realize that there's a natural process that we get in the way of right yeah. we did not teach a one-year-old how to walk they just watch other people and they try it and they do it it's the same with creative thinking a five-year-old didn't go to class for it and like you say, Judy, we need a class to train them not to lose it, but we certainly don't need to teach them how to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's because there's a process, and that process works the way I just described. Yeah. It begins with, it begins with working from a space of clarity and safety, which the five-year-old doesn't need to create. They, they live in it. Um, and then it goes through the questions of building a sense of identity around the ideas you're going to have. And five-year-olds, again, they don't think about that but they try different identities out, you know, and you're only going to get the ideas that a person like that would have. You're not going to get the ideas that, you know, Judy, you're not going to get the ideas of a, of a, of a black 72 uh, year old man who lived in the South of America for his whole life, yeah. unless you put yourself in that position. And that's what like actors do. Writers do. They put themselves in the position of those characters and yeah. that's how they get the ideas of how to behave like those characters. You know, and if we can apply that kind of thinking to ourselves, we are then able to have the ideas of someone other than ourselves. And that's the only way to be more creative. Otherwise, you're going to be the same amount of creative you are. Do you do, I, I was just thinking of, of, of using, because you, your actor analogy is quite interesting as well. So, and it, of course, it feeds into your background a bit, but I'm, do you do? No, I'm not an actor at all. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Behind the scenes then. But it yeah. was, uh, it was your, it's that I'm feeling like, I'm sorry, this is actually formulating in my head as I'm, I'm seeing this, but I tend to, I can close my eyes and put myself in a place to visualize what that experience in the future would be. Is that something that in your creative training that you help people do? Is, am, I, am I completely in a different zone? which is possible. Look, it's a bit of a different zone. I mean, the thing is this, I, you know, I've got a specific training model that I've worked with up until now, and it would be foolish of me to stick with that model um, because I'm talking about how not to stick with the things that you already have. Right. <laughs> um, so I can only speak for Position what you heal thyself. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So, so in the current way it works, uh, that would fit in a little bit, but it's not really there in terms of the way you've described it. Um, in the sense of we, when we talk about identity, we look at what are some of the types of identity that you could have that would be a different way of thinking than you have. You know? Okay. Um, and then you put that in their space and let them adopt it. But you're getting into a mastery level conversation. If a hundred people do a training, maybe, or, you know, even companies, maybe 2% or 5% are going to embrace it with passion. Uh -huh. Uh, other people will just get get it and they'll get the the they'll get the experience some results and benefits but my experience is you know maybe that's short maybe i could say 10 percent. but it's it's you know the people that really embrace it with passion are the ones that are going to look at it the way you just did right because the bottom line is to transform ourselves is is a daily process yeah and the minute that i stop doing it then i stop doing it so yeah. If today I put all my passion into it and then a month from now I stop doing it and start living on reflex, then I will have transformed myself in that month and then I will stop there. Yeah. 
only a small number of people are wanting, I think, to live in a world where they can constantly recreate themselves, uh, where they have the skill and ability and, and, and mastery to literally realize at every moment that what they just thought is a product of their past. And that they must be able to simultaneously hold that thought because they don't want to, you can't do nothing, you can't be nobody. Yeah. But at the same time as holding that thought to then be free to think other thoughts that seem to conflict with it. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not at that level, I can tell you. <laughs> that, that, no, 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 I, I, and I understand that because I, it's come into my radar as such as, as a very interesting proposition and I quite like it because I love change. But, of course, I'm not the typical. Most people, as you rightfully said, can't deal with that level of constant change, which is, yeah, normal. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I've maybe I've gone too far into the into the woo woo, but it's, yeah, you know. <laughs> no, 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 it's, no it's it's interesting because I I think you know I don't, I don't I don't think you have to go into the you know out there stuff to be creative and to do what you obviously teach. That's not the point, but it's it's an I love the idea of of expanding your mind and for those who want to embark on innovation and creativity then you have to expand that mind you have to be able to think beyond your your current box and I, all of everything you've said is just makes total more sense to me so uh, and again if you are uh, feel like you're confined then you know doing training like yours makes total sense to me i can imagine it just the great benefits they would have long term if they chose to embrace it oh yeah no absolutely and look like i said i mean most people aren't going to go to that level of i don't know what the right word is but it, but on a practical level it certainly does going through a process of intentional transformation makes a big difference in people's yeah. lives regardless of if they're going to become you know, completely uh, embroiled in it. I mean, just like writing in a notebook can help people on a daily basis. One of the exercises, basic exercises of doing this is simply to write in a notebook without thinking um, mm -hmm. on a daily basis, if possible. You know, just take 15 minutes and write whatever comes out of your head. It unclogs <laughs> your head. Uh, it, it gives your subconscious space to express itself when you stop thinking. and the point of all that is ultimately that it doesn't mean you're going to become a novelist, right? Yeah. Uh, but it can still benefit you greatly to do that 15 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be your goal. It doesn't have to be what you care about in life. It a little bit can, can help a lot. If yeah. That makes more sense. Yeah. That's really I want to say one thing. Uh, if we, I know we're probably out of time. Um, no, 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 no. You're, you're right. I'm enjoying the conversation. So I hope everyone, I'm sure everyone else will be. <laughs> One thing that, that I think is really important to note at this time that is in the way of a lot of people that in terms of what we talked about, about the struggle, you know, there's this, there's this incredible meme of thought going around right now that we are in a very uncertain time. Mm. So I'd like to disabuse people of this idea that we're in, in an uncertain time, right? Right. This time right now is no more certain or uncertain than any other time. We like to say that the 9-11 was uncertain in 2008 was uncertain and now is even more uncertain. The only thing that's uncertain is people. Like the time is not uncertain. There's no certainty or, or uncertainty in the world. Like if I look at a tree, it's a tree, but where, show me where there's uncertainty. Mm. You can't see it. It's not there. Mm. So what's really important for people to realize is what's out there that we're dealing with is not uncertainty. It's in us that there's uncertainty. And there's a collective agreement around the idea that right now we are all uncertain. Mm. It doesn't mean that the times we live in are uncertain. And the critical thing about that is that uncertainty gives us a lot of discomfort. Yes. It gives us, you know, people don't like being uncertain. We don't like it. It's unsafe. It's, it feels bad. Yeah. Right? They did a study on cancer patients. Cancer patients were happier to know the result of their test, mm. even though this is all patients who had cancer. Mm. So every 100% of them were given bad results. Mm -hmm. And yet their anxiety levels and their upset levels were far higher right before they got the results than after they got the results. Yeah. 
it gives people comfort to be certain about bad things more than being uncertain. Yeah. So one of the things that people can start to do also to deal with the struggle is to start to deal with the reality of the uncertainty is simply inside their own head. Mm. You know, the fact that I have a job doesn't make my life more certain. Mm -hmm. The fact that I'm married doesn't make my life more certain. You know, there's lots of stories of people who came home and one day after 30 years, their marriage ended instantly. Yeah. There's lots of people who were very healthy and they got hit by a bus and died. Yeah. And there's stories that people hear all the time about like how I 30 years ago had cancer and they told me I had a week to live and here I am today. Yeah. yeah. So tell those people that, that having cancer made their life more certainly dead. No, it didn't. You know, mm. tell people that are healthy that that makes them more certainly going to live better. No, it doesn't. Mm. Uncertainty. And I, I know I'm being really repetitive, but it's so critical for people to get this uncertainty only exists inside people's heads. Yeah. Oh, that's a so, great message. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, so the, so much the simplest you. thing we can do is to start to accept that we have feelings of uncertainty. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. And, you know, it's better to do something than do nothing. Yeah. Because if you do something, you have to do something else. Yeah. If you do nothing, you can continue to do nothing. Hmm. So saying I'm not doing something because I'm uncertain, it's kind of a whole lot of it's kind of a whole lot of stacks of mental games, right? Mm. The bottom line is, yeah, life is uncertain because that's how human beings are. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually really like that a lot. I think that's a very, very powerful message. So one, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I, again, I'm talking to a lot of business people and things and, and there's a lot of this, again, it, it's like they're facing the lion. They're, they're so frightened but, and, and even if they can pay the bills, even if they are going to survive this, which most of them, the, the ones I particularly think about, they can and they will, but you're right. It's this not, and it's not having control, I think, is the other key aspect. So the, the, the comments I seem to be getting is that because it's out of my control, normally I can do something and it will fix it. When it's out of your control, that brings a whole different emotional thing. So we're going on to a slightly different subject, of course, a bit slightly intense, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, on a lighter note. But, I think the but, other... but here's the, the funny thing is it's not a different subject, right? Because, you know, people have this, again, going right back to the beginning, people have this idea that creativity is somehow about doing art. Mm. And it, it's not, you know, it's about learning to walk. Children learning to walk are being creative. They don't, they don't know how to do it. Now they're doing it. And it becomes this thing that we then use as a metaphor for how easy something is, like walking. Yeah. Right. And yet, it was an innovation for every one of us, every single human being. We had to innovate ourselves to become walkers. Yeah, we had to do you know? something that we hadn't done before to meet the need at the time. And we had to work out what it was because if you wanted to get to the other side of the room... You had to work that out. Yeah, and here's the funny thing, right, Eric? Is 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 almost every human being did it. Yes. And and we lived in a world in which in that world at the time, everybody else could do this thing and we couldn't do it. <laughs> Imagine how frustrating that would be now if you're a grown-up. Yeah. Everybody, you're in a business, you're looking around, everybody else is making themselves rich and you are failing time after time after time. Most people might, you know, I don't even want to think what they do. Yeah, yeah. And yet a little, less than one year old or, you know, a little child, they just eventually get up and do what everybody else does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So another comment I'm getting a lot from small business at the moment is that, oh, everyone else is doing that. So I'm trying to be different. I'm trying to be creative. And, and, I'm, and, so you, and you can hear the stress, of course, in their voices while they're saying this. But it's like, um, oh, no, everyone's doing it online now. And, and so I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. And, oh, they just got published. You know, so is this almost like a panic thing going on again uh. Uh, about trying to be creative? And, of course, you, you did touch on this earlier because you cannot create from a space like that. You've got to go for a walk first or, or go and touch a tree, do whatever you have to do to make yourself chill out a bit. But 
uh, I think that's what I'm seeing a lot of is, is their, that they, they feel this need to be creative, yet they're panicking about it. And they can't separate the two yet. Well, what they're doing is trying to think out of the box. Mm, okay. Can you, can you see that? I can now, yeah. It, it, they're trying to do something different than what is done or whatever. They're not thinking from their own strength. They're not thinking from their own existence where they are now. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It is <laughs> crazy when you almost, say it, as simple as that. But of course, it's not crazy <laughs> when you're going through it. Well, it doesn't feel like no, it's, it's frustrating. Yeah. But it, it, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if they would sit still and go, okay, what are we already good at? I mean, they, you know, when Bic, um, when Bic was first created, it, it, it only made pens. Yeah, yeah. And for our, probably almost three decades, that's all they did. And they hit a point in their history where uh, they weren't expanding anymore. Their expansion was based on geography. They, they spread from France to everywhere in the world. Yeah. And the way they expanded, if you look at what they are now, you know, what, what does Bic make now? Actually, I can't think. <laughs> so that's they embarrassing. Make lighters, they make lighters and razors, oh, right? There you go. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't But how did they get to lighters and razors? Well, look at it for a second. The pens, the only pens they sold. Originally, when they started, they sold expensive pens and stuff. But at some point, they realized that this plastic, disposable, cheap pen was the way to make a good business. And mm -hmm. that's all they sold. Mm. So when they shifted to the new things, it was plastic, disposable, cheap things. Right? So they didn't think out of the box. They just made the box bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. If they'd sat there and said, oh, what can we do that's different than everybody else? You know, they might still be sitting in that room. Yeah. What they did was they looked at the box they had and they said, what could we add to this box that would still fit in this box? Well, if we yeah. took away pens and just kept plastic cheap and disposable, you know. Love it. That's most, right. most of the great innovative companies, that's how they work. Look at Apple. Yeah. They didn't invent anything. Yeah. Do you know who invented the mouse? Well, I'm going to say, no, no, well, it's assume IBM. In the lab. Was it? Okay, there yeah, you go. Way back, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it was an individual, but the first company to have a mouse was Xerox. Oh, there you go. And uh, the first, the, the, the icon user interface that Apple uses, Xerox. Now, I know what you're thinking. Xerox made computers. Mm, yeah, well, I yeah, only got photocopiers, but anyway. But, but yeah, so I mean, Apple didn't invent anything. Steve right. Jobs just had a really good knack yeah. for, and he said it himself, that they stole everything. Yeah. But he had a really good knack for finding, figuring out what people wanted and making yeah. it the way they wanted it. Exactly. And, and that was innovative enough to make them the biggest company in the world. Yeah, and then that'll do most people, I would think. <laughs> They'd be quite happy to be that innovative. You know, I briefly want to talk about your book, The Innovation Explosion. So maybe the next few minutes, just explain to us, what would people get from reading your book? They'll get my ever-dying gratitude to start with. Um, <laughs> That's a great start. I love it. Thank you. They'll get negative whatever dollars in their account of what yeah. it costs to buy. <laughs> Look, the book is two things. The book is, on the one hand, lays out the training um, in, a, in a verbal way. Okay. So people could go through it themselves without bothering to hear my voice or watch my videos, which could be of great value to some people. <laughs> the other thing it has is, is a more philosophical approach to the, a lot of things we've discussed, which is looking at the idea that came up already many years ago that we are heading for a time in which learning, unlearning, relearning is the, you know, the most important skill. Interestingly, Alvin Toffler never said what people think he said. He was quoting uh, somebody else when he said uh, the most famous quote from that book. But what he did mention is that uh, what, what that quote was, was that, the, that in the future, uh, the ability to learn will be the equivalent of literacy today. That it'll be more important to know how to learn by yourself than to know how to read and write. Hmm. And, you know, if you think about how important literacy actually is today, yeah. then that's saying a lot. Yeah. He didn't say that. He, he wrote the quote in his book from somebody else. But right. he did point out later in the book that this idea of unlearning and relearning as a, as a skill is the skill of the future, is the thing that people need to learn how to do. So the book, uh, maybe I've gone a little bit off into the stands again, but the book uh, looks at that 
that idea in places. This is actually written just before COVID, so I've had to kind of figure out how to restructure it a little bit because it seems more obvious now. You know, looks at the idea of, look, you need to learn this stuff, whether it's my system or somebody else's system, whatever it is, like you need to learn how to be flexible in your thought. You need to realize that creativity is the ability to think differently from yourself. It's not something that you're going to get by wishing you had the same creativity as other people. You can only create your own creativity, you, you know, and it is a choice. It's a creation. It's, it's something that you choose and, and, and make. Even a five-year-old, we don't know what this is like because we don't have studied this, but yeah. you know, I wonder what happens to a five-year-old when you start training them how to stay creative because ultimately the creative expression they have to develop needs to be their own. And hmm. we talked about indigenous societies, you know, ultimately they all start by teaching you the things you have to do that are the same for everybody. But in the end, it's a, it's a vision quest for yourself, right? And how you fit into the whole. Yeah. So the idea of the book is really about, you know, how do you take what people are saying now about the way the world needs to go and apply it to yourself in order to be part of this coming, perhaps coming faster than expected yeah. uh, explosion of innovation being critical as yeah. the skill that you need, you know, and yeah. yet, and yet we all were born with it. And yet we couldn't walk if we weren't innovative. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the book basically looks at those two things is how, here's a system that does work. Uh, generally, why do you need the system? I have to say, and I don't normally say this, so I'll just put it out there, but I will definitely read your book. Yeah. And something you mentioned, Michael, in your LinkedIn article that this idea of when you're participating in the society that you're thinking about what you're giving to that society rather than just taking. And I think you called it the consumer culture versus the producer culture that, you know, to get through this struggle um, rather than the uncertain time, but to work through this will actually require us all working together and uh, contributing our particular skills, I think. Yeah, very good. Really keen to hear, Michael, about the song that is coming out called Kindness Contagion. Can you tell us some more about that? Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you for asking about that. Um, so we've, as the Human Innovation Project, uh, we found out about the United Nations had put out a call uh, at the beginning of April for artists or creators around the world to respond to certain messages that they had listed. and. Uh, you know, it's just a, just sort of an open, an open call. It wasn't really like you're going to win money or something, but so right. they, one of the messages was kindness contagion, which we thought was a really great phrase, you know, yeah. um, idea obviously being that instead of a sickness, it's a contagion of kindness. Hmm. And I looked it up and actually it has been used in the past, uh, but not a lot. So it's an interesting, hmm. an interesting sort of meme to work with because it's not heavily used, but it's also, got some existence out there right and so i contacted a couple of musicians that i know in south africa i, I used to do a, a music show um, so I know, I know a lot of musicians and and we started making this song which we wanted from the beginning to not be a south african but a, rather an african response to this call and yeah it really blew up so we've got almost 30 right now african artists committed All to right. doing the song it's, it's in the process of being recorded a couple of biggest producers in Africa are producing it. You can find out all about the song, which will be released on Africa Day, which is the 25th of May. And if you don't know what Africa Day is, you should find out that too, because it's important. <laughs> okay. Yes. But you can find that out just by looking up Africa Day. You'll get lots of stuff. But the, the song itself will be at kindnesscontagion.africa, which is the, the website you can go to now. If you're hearing this before Africa Day, you can, you can go to that website or rather register on the website to download the song or to, to, to get notice when it's put up, which will be on Fabulous. Africa. Fabulous. Thank you. This has been enlightening. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. My brain, because it's, of course, getting late in our evening, my brain will probably be going <laughs> all night dissecting all of this. That's, that's a bit of my, that's my box. So, Michael, tell me, how can people get involved in your course, your training, all the other great stuff that you're doing? Have you got a website that people can go to? You know, I have a website, but I'm going to give you a different address because what I've found is that there's so much going on right now that it's best to just be really quick and clear about the things. So I've created a separate page on my website and I'm going to make it really easy for people. The name of my company is Create Your Creativity. So it's CYC, right? Right. So uh, if you go to the bit.ly address, 
bit.ly yep. slash CYC all a a l l c y c a l l okay um you'll get a sort of and that's capital letters if you don't put capital letters on the c y c all you'll get a pakistani video site um <laughs> I, i've tried it so for some reason uh bit.ly slash c y c all yep. then you'll have a breakdown of what's current what's currently most useful uh in terms of what is being done or being offered fantastic now you know Michael, thank you so very much for, for joining us today. We've very much enjoyed that. Eric's has a huge page of notes, uh, so that always says a lot. And um, really value, value your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for staying up a little extra at work to, to accommodate me. Absolute pleasure.